G'day everyone, Nick here again from CPAP Reviews. Firstly, a big thanks to all my awesome YouTube subscribers who continue to watch, like, and support my channel. I really appreciate it. For those of you who are new to sleep apnea and CPAP therapy, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the little bell next to it, and I'll keep you up to date on the wonderful world of CPAP therapy. Now, in today's educational video, I'm gonna be talking to you about sleep apnea. Uh, what it is, what causes it, and lastly, how do we treat it? All right, let's get to it. All right, firstly, what is sleep apnea? Well, apnea literally means stopping breathing. So if you suffer from sleep apnea, when you're sleeping, air stops flowing to your lungs for 10 seconds or more. Now, when you stop breathing, your blood oxygen levels drop, and this triggers your brain to just wake up out of sleep for a microsecond, just so you can take a breath, and then you fall back asleep again, and this cycle continues throughout the night. Now, this stopping of your breathing can happen many times an hour, night after night, and it can not only affect the quality of your sleep and your sleep cycle, but it also puts your body in a very stressful environment at a time when it's supposed to be resting, relaxing and recovering from the day's activities. Left untreated, sleep apnea can cause some pretty severe health consequences. And these include uh, stroke, heart disease, so heart attacks, high blood pressure, diabetes, depression, car accidents, as well as a list of other things, including my all-time nightmare, which is uh, erectile dysfunction and loss of libido. So it's very important that we do get tested for sleep apnea if we do think there might be something going on with our sleep. Now, there's three main types of sleep apnea. There's obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, and mixed sleep apnea. And I'll go through these with you now. So obstructive sleep apnea is the most common by far. And if you suffer from OSA, basically what's happening is those muscles uh, in your upper airway, your tongue, your throat, your mouth, when you're falling asleep and you're relaxing, they're just relaxing a bit too much and they're falling back and just obstructing your upper airway there. So they're basically closing off your your trachea where the air comes in. And, and causes of obstructive sleep apnea include the number one is probably being overweight. So if you are carrying a bit more weight, you're more prone to having sleep apnea. There's no doubt about that. We carry a lot of weight in our, in our neck here. And so the more weight you got, when you lie there, it's putting more pressure on those muscles, um, more weight on those muscles. So when they relax, it's more likely to just close over. Sinus issues. So if you've got nasal polyps or if you've got a deviated septum, sinusitis, you know, a lot of congestion, those sort of things. If you get a lot of hay fever, that can cause sleep apnea as well. Uh, just your general anatomy. So just your makeup of the structure of your neck and your jaw and your throat. So a lot of Asians uh, have really narrow airways. So that's just your general anatomy makeup. Sleeping tablets, smoking, alcohol consumption, all the good things. <laughs> And uh, simply sleeping on your back can, can also cause it as well. Now, central sleep apnea is far less common. So with central sleep apnea, there's not an actual obstruction. What there is, there's a bit of a fault happening between the signal that's sent from our brain to our lungs. So normally your brain's telling your lungs to, to breathe. And with central sleep apnea, there's a bit of a signal fault happening there. And so your lungs just aren't getting told to breathe. So your airway can be open, but you're just not getting you know, that signal down to your lungs to breathe. And central sleep apnea can actually go undiagnosed quite often because there's, there can sometimes be no snoring associated with it. With obstructive sleep apnea, there's normally a lot of noises and snoring that goes along with it because of the restriction. So generally people have a, are a bit more aware that there's something going on. But with central sleep apnea, you might not get those noises. And then the last one is mixed sleep apnea. And mixed is just a combination. So you've got a combination of both obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea happening in the one person. So it can be a little bit more complex. But they're your three types of sleep apnea. Now, without treatment, you'll most likely have sleep apnea for life, unfortunately. So it is important that we treat it. And the older we get, the more severe the sleep apnea tends to become. So if we have mild sleep apnea when we're younger and we don't do anything about it, as we get older, it generally gets a bit worse because 
We tend to put a bit more weight on, become a bit heavier. Uh, everything becomes a bit more loose, a little bit, you know, less firm. The muscles in our in our throat and neck relax a little bit, so it does get a little bit worse. And there's a number of ways we treat sleep apnea, and sometimes we use a combination approach. So we use a combination of treatments to really help uh, reduce the severity of that sleep apnea. And let's go through them. So one, uh, weight loss and lifestyle changes. So Weight loss is a big one. Uh, obviously, if you can you know, bring that weight down, it's gonna go a long way to helping reduce the severity of your obstructive sleep apnea. But it ain't always easy, especially if you do have sleep apnea, because if you have sleep apnea, you're generally pretty tired during the day, you don't feel very energetic, so it's very hard to then go and do exercise and do the right things to get your weight down. So it can be quite a challenge, which is why we sort of tend to do CPAP therapy with weight loss, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Also lifestyle changes. So <laughs> stopping smoking and avoiding alcohol consumption of an evening. Alcohol is very enjoyable because it's a muscle relaxant and makes us very relaxed. But what we want to avoid when we're sleeping is excessive muscle relaxing because that's what's causing the obstruction to happen. So you want, you really want to avoid that uh, glass of wine before bed and obviously yeah, quit smoking, which is just a, a general rule of thumb for a healthy life in general. Uh, the next one is positional therapy. So what that means is just staying off your back um, when you're sleeping. So just sleeping on your side. This doesn't work for everyone, obviously, but these are just some of the treatment options. There's a number of devices, but obviously the easiest one is to um, you know, get a tennis ball and put in a stocking or something like that and wrap it around you because uh, it's not too enjoyable sleeping on a tennis ball. But there's a number of other positional adjustment devices that you can buy as well. Mandibular therapy. Now, what this is, these are like the mouth guards that you might've seen. There's a lot of cheap knockoff ones that you want to avoid. You know, those $30 ones on eBay that don't do anything. I'm talking about proper mandibular advancement splints or devices. They keep your, your bottom jaw from falling back. So they're generally made by a mold, like a dentist will make a mold for you and then it will get shipped off and, and made up for your specific mouth and jaw shape. Um, so they do some, some measurements and things like that. But basically they've got little adjustments on them so you can move the bottom part of the mouth guard forward and you can retract your bottom of your jaw. So it keeps your jaw forward and that in turn sort of stretches out everything and keeps it sort of from relaxing and falling back in your throat. These sort of devices are mainly used for more mildish cases. So you're snoring to your mild sleep apnea. Uh, the more severe the sleep apnea gets, the more you need a bit more heavier therapy. Uh, and just on that note, I think I'll quickly just touch on severity of sleep apnea. So the severity of sleep apnea is based on how many apneas you're having per hour. We call this the apnea hypopnea index. So to give you an idea, if you're less than five, so you're having less than five apneas per hour, so you stop breathing less than five times an hour, you're in a healthy, a healthy category, which is great. If you stop breathing between five and 14 times, you're considered mild severity, 15 to 29, moderate severity. And once you crack 30, uh, we just uh, put you in the group of severe, okay? So you're in the severe, whether you're 30, 40, 50, 60, 100. And I've seen plenty of people that stop breathing 100 times an hour. And you normally get that number from a sleep test, but we won't go into that just in this episode. Okay, now going back to treatment, uh, once we've sort of exhausted our non-invasive treatments, uh, then last resort, we can go to sort of more invasive treatments like surgery options. There's a number of different surgeries that they do that, you know, some will be sort of like sinus surgery where you might uh, get a deviated septum fixed up or remove some nasal polyps, make it easy to breathe through your nose. So an ENT does this sort of stuff, you know, somnoplasty, which is where they remove sort of some of the soft tissue at the back of your throat there. There's some laser surgery, which does some scarring, which sort of, um, you know, firms up everything at the back of the throat, as well as removing your tonsils, adenoids. So there's a number of surgical options out there, but it's important that we sort of first exhaust our non-invasive treatment options, which are a lot more enjoyable and far less painful then jumping down the surgical road there. So now we'll talk about my favorite of the therapies, the stuff that I do all the time, which is positive airway pressure therapy. Okay, so this is the gold standard. This is the most common form of treating sleep apnea. And for those of you that know nothing about it, it's basically you have a little device, a machine uh, with some tubing and a little, you wear a little mask when you go to bed and this device creates basically air pressure at the end of the day. 
Okay, it's positive airway pressure. Now, positive airway pressure, to put it simply, is when the pressure on the outside of your body is higher than the pressure in your lungs. Okay, what that does is it forces air into your lungs. Okay, it forces air in because the, the air just travels down the pressure differential from being high pressure to low pressure. The air just comes in and it forces air into your lungs. Think of it kind of like a, a balloon. So if we blow up a balloon, obviously the air pressure inside the balloon is higher than the air pressure on the outside of the balloon. There's a lot more pressure inside the balloon. And if we let go of that balloon, the air just shoots out and it does that because the air is just going from high pressure to low pressure. So we're basically just doing the opposite, which is shooting air in to help our you know, lungs open up, keep our airway nice and open. And this uh, treats the sleep apnea brilliantly. It does it really well. Now there's a few types of this form of therapy, so positive airway pressure therapy. And I'll just discuss them with you now because it can be a little bit confusing for some, but it's important just to understand the different forms of the therapy. So the first one is just continuous positive airway pressure, which is CPAP. That's a word that many of you will have heard. Some of you might not, but many of you will. So with, with continuous positive airway pressure, that machine, your device, is set to one preset level of therapy pressure, one pressure level. So when you're breathing in and out, there's just one level of pressure. Another form of continuous positive airway pressure is what we call automatic positive airway pressure. So it's still continuous. There's still continual pressure coming in. It's just, it's not preset to one fixed level. Automatic or APAP, so that's what we call APAP. The machine itself will monitor your breathing and then it will regulate that pressure up and down, minute by minute, hour after night. So it's still continual. The pressure's still coming in nonstop when you're breathing in and out, but it varies depending on the severity of your sleep apnea. So if your airway's nice and open, the automatic's gonna say nice and low, but if you're having snoring, if you're having obstructive sleep apnea events, lots of them, you roll onto your back, that machine will pick up that information and it'll gradually increase the pressure to treat the sleep apnea. All right, that's your automatic ones. There's a, another form of therapy called BiPAP. Now, with BiPAP, that's normally used to treat uh, either people with complex or mixed sleep apnea. So remember that central sleep apnea that I was talking about, that mixed sleep apnea? So with, we use generally BiPAPs to treat those people. We do sometimes use CPAPs and APAPs as well. So we can start with that. And if it's not working out, then we'll, we'll use the BiPAPs. They're a bit more technologically advanced than the other forms of therapy. And also sometimes we use BiPAP for people who might have obstructive sleep apnea, but they're not coping with CPAP or APAP. So they're finding it too hard to breathe out against the pressure. They can't quite get it, so we can move them to a BiPAP. And the reason we can move them to a BiPAP is with BiPAP therapy, we set one fixed level for when you're breathing in and also a different level of pressure for when you're breathing out. So the, the pressure when you're breathing in is can sometimes be a lot higher than the pressure when you're breathing out. What this does is, is it helps the person, supports the person when they're breathing, when they breathe in. But when they exhale, instead of exhaling and really struggling to breathe out against that pressure, it's a lot easier for them to also breathe out. So you get the therapy when you breathe in, a lot easier when you breathe out. And we call those two values IPAP and EPAP. So inhalation, positive airway pressure, exhalation, positive airway pressure, and we can set those different values Generally, uh, your physician will sort of work out, you know, where best to set those values. The BiPAPs are also used to treat other conditions, other lung, you know, lung conditions, COPD, um, some other sort of neurological uh, lung conditions as well. If you are someone who has really struggled getting used, like you've got sleep apnea, but you're really struggling with your CPAP and your APAP, you've tried them both and you can't do it, maybe speak to your health professional about trialing a, a BiPAP therapy device. They do cost a lot more, which is generally why we sort of stick to, you know, steer people into these CPAP and APAPs to begin with. But I, I personally believe that probably over time and as that technology becomes cheaper and those machines become maybe a bit more affordable, we might actually transition to BiPAP being your, your, your gold standard, your go-to therapy uh, in the future because it really is a lot easier on the person when they're breathing out. And that's one of the downsides of that you know, CPAP and APAP, it's quite hard because of that continual pressure coming in all the time. It's sometimes be quite hard to breathe out. People do always struggle with that little part, especially in the beginning. So 
little tip for you there. Don't give up if you've failed on CPAP and APAP. There are other devices available. Yeah, so that's basically it for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did enjoy the video and you found it somewhat useful, uh, make sure you give us the thumbs up, hit the like button, and uh, I'd also love it if you'd subscribe and support CPAP Reviews YouTube channel. Uh, until next time, have yourself a great day and sleep well. See you later.